Well, good morning again. Welcome on this, uh, I guess we're going to get it twice. It is very relaxing. I like that one. There's no like big bass drop and some of the things we do in our bumpers usually. But uh, welcome to Long Hill Chapel. My name is Michael Hadi. I'm the lead pastor here. I'm so glad you have joined us, whether you are in the room or online. Uh, hey, quick, before we get started, in a couple weeks on uh, the 21st of April, right after church, uh, we're going to have an informal, I'm just calling it a membership gathering if you're a member here. Uh, what I want to do is the opportunity to just kind of bring you into loop about some of the things that we are considering with our facilities and our properties. It's not a, we're not, it's not a congregational meeting. We're not voting on things, but I think it's important just to invite you into the conversation of some of uh, what we are, what we're considering doing. And so that'll be right after the service. It'll be over in the fellowship hall. So it'll be a little less informal, uh, but on the 21st of April, uh, that'll be in all the places this week coming up in the the midweek and in the bulletin and on, on the website and all of that. But I'd love to invite you to that. It's exciting times, but we always are having to continue to navigate and figure out how we're going to move forward together and do that in a way that honors God and is a good stewardship of the resources that we have been given. So it still feels like Easter because Easter was kind of early this year. We still have some of the flowers uh, in our house. We still are working our way through the candy. I don't know if you are. Uh, do any of you parents do the parent tax? You know, your kids get this, you, you do the parrot tax. I do that at Halloween, too. It's like, you, you live here, uh, you don't pay anything to live here, and so it's time to, time to pay up. Uh, we're doing that as well. Uh, last night, my younger son came to me, and he, he said, he's like, he's like, Daddy, Jesus is risen. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. He's three. And then he said, he is risen from the spaghetti. <laughs> and so we're almost there. Um, some of you Italians, that actually is maybe not far from the truth for some of you. But we're still in this Easter series, and we're kind of closing out uh, our series uh, called Starting Today, and it really has been about all the ways that we start with Jesus. We start somewhere, all of us, uh, whether it's in faith or whether we don't have a relationship, or maybe we used to, and we're still trying to figure out where this all fits into our lives. Last week, we talked about the fact that there are times where we start over. There are times where the previous season of our life feels like it's kind of come to an end, it's come to a conclusion, and we're picking up the pieces, and we're, we're trying to begin again. We're trying to start over uh, in a new place and a new way. But then there's this other thing that we do, which is starting out. It's when we start into the next part of the journey, the next part of our lives. And all of these have kind of tracked different parts of the Easter story, and, and that's what we're going to do today as we talk about what it looks like to start out, to leave a place, whether it's a literal place or just a place that we've been living in our hearts or our minds, and, and to start out in, in a new direction going somewhere. And that can be incredibly positive. There's times we love to do that, and there's times where there's a lot of uncertainty around that as well. You know, some of you are finishing up your college years right now, and you're starting out. You're starting out into this new part of your life, and every part of your life before now has been defined for you. You know what's next, and suddenly what's next is not obvious anymore. There's a lot of open decisions that can be made, but you're starting out with a level of both expectation and uncertainty. Some of you, your, your kids are finally out of the house. And you're so thrilled that you have your life back in some sense, but you also miss them incredibly. And you're looking at the transition of what it means now to start out in a new season that hasn't largely been defined by that thing that has taken so much of your love and your heart and your time and your attention and all of the good things. But now it's this question of how do we start out into this next season? A couple of you have worked hard your entire careers, you've been very successful, and now you've come to this place where you're retiring. And that's been the goal. It seems like that's the thing that you're trying to get to. You're trying to get there. You're trying to get there in good enough shape financially, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. But it's really then the question for you of what do you do now? Do you just play golf every single day? Do you go on vacations all the time? What do you do with this next season of your life. And so there's so many different ways, and there's a million more that I haven't talked about, where we start out in this new place. And so starting out and starting over kind of sound the same, but they're different. I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but the English language is very confusing. 
Like I have little kids and I'm teaching them how to say things. And the more you, you spend time around it, the more you realize like there's a lot of words that are the same word, but they mean two completely different things. I actually learned something this week when I was putting this together. There's, there's, there's words like live and live. Same spelling, looks the same, different idea. There's resume and resume. Completely different things, spelled exactly the same. These are called heteronyms. I did not know this, and none of you care, but I just told you something that I didn't know. But there's all these things that seem like they're the same, but they're different. There's close and close. There's present and present. Produce and produce. Desert and dessert. Those are very different from each other, and that's not the good kind of dessert, by the way. That's when you, like, abandon someone. That one has another S, and that's the kind of dessert that we like. But there's these things that they, they sound the same, but they're different. And this whole idea of starting out sounds the same as starting over, but it's actually very different. It's when we move into a new season, and after the pandemic, some of us really hate that word. You know, we're in a new season. We're great, we're in a new season. But you're in a new venture, a new direction. The leaves are starting to come out on the trees, and we can kind of feel that literally. And the good news is that Jesus literally walks with us on every step of this new journey. But understanding how he does it is completely, absolutely critical to us staying on the path. And my prayer for you today is simply this, that you leave here incredibly encouraged with a lot of hope that even though you might be walking into a starting out season, where you're into something new, where the corner is turning, where you're trying to figure out how it all fits together now, you would leave with hope knowing that Jesus himself walks with you. And so we're picking up the story of the Gospels. It's still the Easter story. And we learn that when we start out, just like Jesus' followers were starting out, there's, there's some things that Jesus does with us. And we're looking today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. It's the very end of that account, uh, Luke's account of the life and the work of Jesus. Chapter 24 and verse 13 and following. And it's the story about two of his disciples who are taking a road trip. They're taking a journey. Because they're leaving the place where all of the events of Easter had happened. They're leaving Jerusalem and they're basically headed back home. They're on a road to a place called Emmaus. And we look at the Easter event, most of us, if you're a person of faith, or at least you're a person who is adjacent to faith, you kind of know how the story ended. It was this big triumphant thing where Jesus comes back and the tomb is empty and he rises again on the third day. But these followers of Jesus, and we talked about this some last week, did not have nearly that kind of certainty or understanding. There was this incomplete picture around what was happening. I don't know if you've ever been around an event or something happens in the world. It's kind of like the earthquake that we had on Friday where you're trying to figure out what's happening. I remember where I was, I'm like, did, you know, just did some, someone like run a truck into something? And then my wife started texting me like, oh my gosh, that was an earthquake. And uh, it, it was just, there's this uncertainty and confusion around it in the moment and only in time does it become clear. Put yourself in that mindset as we enter into this story, that there's just uncertainty about what has actually happened. It's a confusing time because everybody you know, saw Jesus crucified. They knew he was buried, but then there's these accounts that have started to trickle out that the tomb was empty, that there was this angel that met some of the women and announced to them, he's not here, he is risen. And so these disciples of Jesus are trying to, as they walk back, as they go into this next season of their lives, trying to figure out what's going on. Verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They're walking, so this is a reasonable but doable walk, seven miles. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as I said, it's this confusing time where there's the reality of what everything looks like, that it's over. But then there's these stories trickling in. There's this thing that some of them had seen that the tomb was empty. 
Did someone take the body? Did Jesus actually do that thing that some of them remembered him talking about? Are we just wishfully thinking and wishfully hoping? You've all been in those kind of aftermath scenarios where you're, you're trying to not get your hopes up. You're trying to stay in reality, but you're trying to sort all of these things out. As they talked, verse 15, and discussed discuss these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked among, along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. I love this because this is two random people somewhere on a road. They're headed out. They're headed away. They're headed back home. And Jesus finds them and he catches up with them. They haven't figured out that it's him yet by whatever means. But this is a great thing, a great encouragement for us who are starting out. And it's this, Jesus finds us wherever we are. Jesus finds us right where we are. Jesus doesn't find us where he thinks we ought to be. Jesus doesn't even find us where we think we ought to be. Jesus finds you, and he finds me right where we are. And so today, some of you are sitting here, you're in the seats, and you're trying to piece some stuff together. You're looking at what happened. Maybe it wasn't your best moment back there. You know, the good news, friends, is Jesus isn't waiting for you to get your act together. He finds you right where you are. And he's walking with us even when we're starting out and we don't recognize that it's him or we can't. So Jesus is with you. Some of you are like, I don't even believe in Jesus. You know what? Jesus is walking with you too. Even when we can't recognize him. You know, I think... There's a, there's a lesson here in our relationship with Jesus, but there's also a lesson when it comes to our relationship with other people. Listen to how this goes on in verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And this is one of those things where, you know, Jesus kind of already knew what was going on. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. So this is like one of those conversations where the, guy, the person's like, you're, you're, are you an idiot? Like, where, have you been like sleeping? Is your, you know, you're living under a rock? You know what's been going on. And Jesus invites them out and he doesn't like, of course I know what's going on. He, he says, what things? And here's what I love about this, is Jesus already knows. He knows your story. He knows where you are. He knows what you're experiencing, but he wants to listen to you. He wants to hear you in your own words. He wants to hear it straight from you. I think sometimes when we're in one of those places where we're not certain or maybe we're not in the place that we thought we should be, or our relationship isn't, or there's the thing that happened, or we're trying to make sense of all of the pieces of the puzzle. Jesus is like, I know where you are, but I want to hear it from you. I want to hear how you are experiencing this, how you're working through this. This is such good news because it means, especially for those of us who are verbal processors, we do not have to have it all figured out before we get to Jesus. And in fact, it's better when we don't. But I think there's this lesson that we can learn when it comes to us and others as well. You know, you've had people come to you and you kind of know their story. And you also, in your mind, you're like, I know exactly what you ought to be doing right now. Like, I know what you need to do. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to get your act together. You, you can do this. But there's something that happens when we just listen. When we just listen, when we withhold judgment, when we withhold even good advice, and we listen to people in their own words anyway. And so that's what Jesus does. The story goes on. What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Remember, they don't recognize it's him. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. 
The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. So we had this thing that we hoped was going to happen, and it doesn't seem like it did. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Here's where it begins to turn, though, a little bit, because Jesus doesn't just, like, nod and listen passively. He steps into the moment, and he reconnects them with the whole story. They've told the story, but there's something that's missing from the story, and it's understanding. He reconnects them, and he does it kind of abruptly. He said to them, verse 25, how foolish you are. We'll come back to that. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Because this was a story that had been told in various pieces that the Jewish people had rehearsed in their hearts and minds in various ways. And so as these disciples are telling the story, they're telling the events of the story, but they're missing the purpose of the story. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, mind you, these aren't just two random people. These are two of his disciples. They've been very close to him. They've heard him talk about all this stuff before himself. They probably grew up reading those same prophets, the same texts in the first half of our Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Torah, that talked about who Messiah was going to be. And somehow, they've missed the pieces coming together. And I think it's easy for some of us to sit here and say, well, that's you silly people. Like, what, wh why haven't you put it together? Why haven't you jumped on board? We have the benefit of distance and hindsight. And it's easy to just become a little judgmental and just talk about how thick-headed they are. But there's this thing about the human condition that I think we need to explore when it comes to us as well. When we're close to our present experiences and our circumstances, and get this, especially when our feelings are high, we have this way, and they have this way of disconnecting us from the bigger picture. So when we're feeling some things, we're experiencing some things, we can see the pieces, but we can miss what's going on. We can miss the forest for the trees. And why is this? You know, I think it would be easy for some of us to sit here and say, well, they just didn't have enough faith. You know, they, they just weren't believing hard enough. These are people who had given their entire lives to that point. They'd left and they'd followed Jesus. So they'd left families and they had left vocations and they'd left a lot of things behind and they had put it all on the line. So I think looking at them and saying, well, if they just had a little more faith, they would have gotten this, is missing the point. That word foolish, it's kind of that strong language, how foolish you are. In the, in the original language, it, it really means like this. You're misinterpreting what's happening here. You're experiencing things, but you're not drawing the right conclusion from the things that you're experiencing. You're not understanding correctly. So why did they do that? And why do we do that? Here's why. Our emotions our terrible filters for our experiences. Our emotions are terrible filters for our experiences. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen to what you're feeling, but it means that you should be somewhat skeptical of what you're feeling in terms of the reality that's around you and in front of you. This is something we desperately need to check because it's one of those things that keeps us from running aground on the rocks of life in all sorts of ways, in our relationships, in our experiences, in the world around us, when we, you know, experience uncertainty, when we turn on the news, when there's an earthquake. Our emotions are terrible filters for our experiences. 
We look from our perspective. We interpret our circumstances. And I don't think we come to the right conclusions. And I will just speak for myself. You know, one of the reasons that having a community of faith like this, a group of people who go through life together, is so incredibly powerful and increasingly rare is it gives us a context to check these things out. It just does. There are times, friends, as your pastor, I come in here on Sunday morning, and I'm just like, I'm not feeling super great about anything. And then I sit here, and we sing together, and we are together, and we talk together, and we have relationships with each other, and it has a tremendously powerful effect on how I see the world and how I see life. And I know that's true for many of you as well. And so one of the best things that we can do when we're feeling a thing is to push the pause button and say, yep, that's there. I'm experiencing it, but I may not be seeing everything. And as, as it says here in the scriptures, as Jesus says to them, I might be drawing the wrong conclusions even when all the pieces are in front of me. This is why we need to tell ourselves, remind ourselves, remind each other again and again and again. Tell ourselves, tell each other the whole story. Because when we anchor ourselves in what's actually true, it does a few different things. Truth anchors you in times of uncertainty. And when you're experiencing something, it will take you in a direction and it will beckon you on a ride. But saying, I am going to stay here. I'm going to stay anchored to this thing. And I might not be feeling this thing, but I know that it's true and I'm not going to leave it. It's the thing that keeps us from drifting off in uncertain times. Truth holds you when situations or circumstances attempt to dislodge or shake you. One of the best things that you can do, and this isn't just like Christian stuff, it is absolutely true with our faith, but it's true in life, is to decide beforehand what is true. To work that out when your emotions are not high, when the circumstances are not in front of you, to say, this is how I'm going to live. These are the things that I value. And so when uncertainty comes or things come that tempt to pull us off of that, we can rehearse what we've already decided. We can do that together. We can do that when the world says, you know, you are not enough unless you buy this thing or have this thing. It can be that simple. But it can be much, much more significant and complex. As a married couple or as, a, as two people in a relationship, when you decide who you are going to be beforehand, it's the thing that can hold you when the circumstances get difficult. This is why if you get married, if, if I happen to marry you, you will exchange wedding vows. Just about every wedding you do that. It's not because you need to tell each other platitudes on your wedding day. It's because you need to remind yourself of what is not only true now, but what will be true over here when the going gets tough, when the circumstances are uncertain. It is deciding who you are going to be. And that does bring us to this third thing. Deciding that in advance keeps you from having to navigate those things in the moment when your feelings, your fears, or even your hopes are calling to you loudly. I think the thing that's really challenging in our culture, in our world, is so much of it, and sometimes it even gets inside the walls of the church, is more and more built around this idea that how I see things, how I experience them, is the measurement of what's true or real. So what I feel about a thing is what's true and what's real. And sometimes that's not the case. You've heard this phrase, you know, you, you have your truth. That's not how truth works. You know, I can have whatever opinions about gravity that I want, but gravity is a thing that operates on its own. Truth anchors us when we work it out in advance, when we return to it, and even sometimes like Jesus does here, when we're reminded of it, even when we have to be brought back so we see things the way that they are. 
Story's still going on. So he's talking. It's a seven-mile ride if you've, or seven-mile walk if you've walked seven miles. It's, it's, it's a long way. But as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Stay with us. Jesus doesn't like crash their house. He doesn't invite himself and he waits for an invitation. I think that's true with us too. You know, Jesus is walking with us. He's walking with us through every circumstance, every part of our lives. But he's not crashing his way into our lives. He's waiting to be invited in. He's waiting to be invited into that place where we're afraid to let go of it where we're not sure how it all works out, where it's not how we wish that it was. He's waiting to be invited in there too. But then he goes in. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it. This sounds awfully familiar. We just did this in the communion meal. This is a direct reminder of the last meal that he had shared with them before he was crucified at the Last Supper. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he does what Jesus does, and he disappeared from their sight. So Jesus opens our eyes to see him differently where we didn't recognize him before. There's this thing that I believe God does. He opens our eyes so that we can see him where we didn't recognize him before. And I love this because what happens here is this is what we do about three times a day every single day. It's a simple, common act of sharing a meal or having a meal. Jesus doesn't like, you know, turn on the smoke machine and the big yellow lights and the big sounds and the explosions and lasers. He is recognized. He is seen in this very simple act. You know, I think this might hit a little close to home. We look for God in the extraordinary. We look for him in the new, the unfamiliar. But the place that he is most evident is in the familiar and even the mundane. We're out looking for the new revelation, the new thing, the new mountaintop, the new high. But Jesus so often, he's waiting for us in these familiar, even mundane places. What if instead of praying for a new experience, we prayed for new eyes? What if instead of looking for the next thing, trying to interpret the signs and the times, we prayed for new eyes to see what's already in front of us, to see what's already available to us. Elsewhere in the Bible, you know, the Apostle Paul is one of the people who says this in in the book of Ephesians. He says this, I pray that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened, that they'd be opened, that you'd know the hope that you're already called to. You'd know what's right in front of you. You'd see it differently. And so Jesus does this. Their eyes are opened, and he disappears. Why does Jesus disappear? This is really annoying. If this happened to you, you'd be like, I, you know, I didn't get the selfie. I, I didn't. <laughs> Nothing good happened. Because we would never move on. Because we would never move on from that place. There's another story in the Gospels where this kind of big event happened where the glory of God is kind of shown and Jesus is there and some of the Old Testament prophets make an appearance and and the disciples are basically like, this is awesome. We should set up shop here. We should build some stuff. Maybe sell some tickets. You know, we could have a food booth over there. And it's because we want to stay in here. We want to stay in the experience. And who wouldn't want to do that? But Jesus isn't done with these disciples who have been trying to figure out what their starting over, starting out path looks like. As much as he has revealed himself to them, then he gives them a job to begin to do that to others. Verse 32, they ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What do you do with a burning heart? Some of you are thinking about all the spicy food that I tell you that you should go eat. It's not that kind of burning heart. 
What do you do when there's something that has lit you ablaze, that has motivated you, that you're passionate about? You know, we're, we're passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about baseball, and I'm passionate about spicy food, and I talk about upstate New York, and rockets, and chocolate, and, and all those things are fun, and they're important, but there's also some things that are really important to me that are core to my being. I'm passionate about this church. I'm passionate about my family. We all have things that really matter to us that whether we know it or not, sometimes we give our lives to. What do you do when your heart is burning within you? That's the thing that begins to motivate you regardless of where the path leads. When you are lit ablaze inside, it's the thing that allows you to step into uncertainty because it drives you forward and it drives you out. Look what happens to these disciples who were going home. Remember, where, where were they coming from? They were coming from Jerusalem. Look what happens next, verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Seven-mile walk this way, seven-mile walk this way. They turn around immediately and they headed back. There they found the eleven, which is the rest of the disciples, and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way, and Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Jesus keeps moving so that we'll move on. He keeps moving so that we'll move on, so we won't just get stuck in the spot. So we won't keep reliving the experience as good as it is. And this becomes a message to us here in this church. I'll tell you, friends, one of my favorite things to do is to come here on Sunday morning and to be with you. It's like there's never a Sunday morning there. I mean, there's some mornings where I'm not feeling great, but I always know I want to be here. I don't want to go to another church. You know, I don't want to sleep in. I want to be here. Yes, it is my job to do that. But I love being part of this community. I love worshiping with you. I love seeing you. I love talking to you. I love giving you hugs if you're so comfortable enough to do that or shaking your hand if you're not or doing this if you really aren't sure about me. But I love being here. But it's not about in here. It's great in here. I love being here, and some of you do too. We need to be in here, but in here isn't the end. In here is for us to encounter the same things that we talked about that these disciples encountered in Jesus so that we can go out there. So we're in here so that we can go out there. It's comfortable in here. Well, at least as comfortable as you can be on wooden pews. It's comfortable. Here's the thing with comfort. Comfort's a healthy thing when it's part of your life. It is an unhealthy thing when it becomes your life. Comfort is healthy when it's part of your life. There's nothing more than I love of going, laying on my couch and taking a nap on Sunday afternoon. If I never left, that would become a problem in a hurry. Comfort is good for inspiration, for recovery, for rest, sometimes for healing. We ought to do it. We need to do it. But ultimately, it's never good for strength or for growth. And so maybe today, maybe in your faith, but maybe just in some area of your life, you need a burning heart. You need a sense of passion to share everything you've seen and you've heard. To start out. To move on. But if you'll take that step today, Jesus will meet you right where you are. Maybe he's already there, and you just need to see him with new eyes. But maybe we need to get up, turn back, go back. Let that burning heart that God has placed within us motivate us, encourage us to step into the new season the new reality, the next day, with all of its uncertainty, but all of its possibility, knowing that Jesus walks with us every step of the journey along the way. Would you pray with me?
God, I thank you for the encouragement of your word. I know that there are people in this room who are there at one of those turning points where everything behind them has kind of come to a close, where there's a turn in a new direction that's beckoning, where they're at the crossroads of that. And maybe they've gotten stuck. Maybe they've lost heart. Maybe they have a lot of questions. Maybe it just seems like too tall of a task. Would you do only what you can do, which is meet each of us? Meet us right where we are. Find us exactly on the way and walk with us. And as we walk with you, would that begin to change our hearts so that they're no longer weighed down, they're no longer filled with uncertainty or even fear, but they're burning hearts. They're burning hearts that once again give us the strength to stand up and to continue the journey. I thank you that you are at work in every one of our lives, whether we recognize you or not. You're at work in every relationship. You're always moving. And I pray that you'd show that to each of us today where we need to see you. But it wouldn't just be an experience in here. It would be something that we walk with out there as well. We thank you for our time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.